Um, so our first speaker is Dr. Aniruddha Chatterjee. He is a uh, lab head in the pathology department here at the university. And in 2017, he was awarded one of the uh, Rutherford Discovery Fellowships. So welcome. All right. So this is not a scientific talk. So I just thought I'll tell a bit of stories of, of you know, how things happen. And I'm probably talking about the traditional academic path here. Uh, but some of the decisions and some of the other things you might associate and probably is applicable to other things. So. Uh, when I was a kid, my, my dad gave me a book, which was actually a biography book. You know, there's a big book in Bengali, and then you have short biographies. One of the big section was on scientists. And uh, I did those, you know, biographies. And uh, like a lot of popular medias, they projected that as a, uh, you know, scientists are crazy and, and stuff like that. Uh, but the thing that <laughs> really interests me was um, um, the sci I, I found scientists cool, actually, uh, when, when I was a kid. And I now realize, actually, why that happened. Because this new thing, you know, discovering new things, so and so, this is the first time discovered this. That was something that I was quite captivated from childhood. Uh, anyway, so when I was doing masters, then at that point, you know, I uh, decided that I'm going to do research because the, getting the new data and the taste of research, I really enjoyed and I wanted to do a PhD. So the first offer I got was from Australia uh, in 2008, uh, but I couldn't go because. Uh, unfortunately, there were some racial attacks on Indian students at the time, and uh, probably some of you know, and that created a lot of political turbulence, and there were other things happened, and I couldn't go. So I finished my master's, and uh, I was ready to go to Australia. I've done my shopping and stuff, but then I couldn't go. So I was actually sitting at home for five, six months, uh, doing nothing uh, after that. So then, then I started uh, sort of applying for other PhDs again, because I decided that, you know, I want to do a PhD. But meanwhile, I was sitting at home, I was jobless, so uh, there was an IT company, uh, American IT company, that uh, I took up this job offer, uh, and I was working there. Now, it's a great job, they say it's a real job, uh, uh, and it was, well paid and everything. Uh, but I, I figured, actually, and became, became like more sure uh, that I can't do this for the rest of my life, uh, because I was pretty bored, to be honest. I couldn't do this every day. I mean, it's a great job, so no offense, but it was not for me. Um, so. Then I got some offers from overseas, okay, and Europe and a few other prestigious institutions and so on. But I decided to come to New Zealand uh, because there was this um, ad that Ian Morrison put up and uh, I found it really interesting work. Uh, I wanted to work on human directly if I could. Uh, so this pro project provided the opportunity. And uh, it combined weight and dye lab. So because I learned some bioinformatics in masters and I got really interested in that and I didn't want to quit, but I didn't want to quit bench either. So I wanted both, you know, so it's probably too much to ask for. Uh, but this project was exactly that. And when I spoke to Ian Morrison, uh, my PhD supervisor, I felt very comfortable. And that was one of the important things for me to decide. I really wanted to feel comfortable uh, and, and like looking up as a sort of mentor to the person I work with. So that was an important factor in the decision. Uh, so, you know, leaving those other offers, I decided to come to New Zealand. A lot of people ask, why do you go to New Zealand? Why not EMBL, you know? But that's what, you know, so what I wanted to say here is that, you know, you might get offered from Harvard, and it's great, of course, to get offered from Harvard, but you really need to think that, is that really what you want? Is that really what, you know, the science, if you do, is that really what sort of, you know, you're passionate about? Because otherwise it will be very difficult to give you 100% in a long journey of science, no matter where you are, you know, how prestigious institute might be. So that's kind of my experience from there. And yeah, that was the first picture I sent to Ian, because I was from India, I thought I should send a formal picture. Uh, to my professor, you know, but that's the email he sent to the department, which I found out later. <laughs> <laughs> you want to send me that one? Uh, anyway, so I started PhD, and this was a postgrad dinner uh, in, in pathology. There used to be tradition. Now, I underestimated New Zealand wine's power, uh, so don't ask me how I got home, but, uh, you know, that's how m m Ian's first impression of me, maybe. Uh, but, anyways, I finished PhD. <laughs> uh, and that, that picture to show that I did some lab work as well, apart from other things. And uh, yeah. But anyway, so finished PhD, and I had a pretty productive time, to be honest, because I was working with a great team, actually. It was a very early days of next gen sequencing, uh, particularly DNA methylation. And I was fortunate to sort of work in that area uh, and got several first author papers and stuff. So it was pretty good, right? What is the confusion, you know? But I was not sure what to do next. And, uh, it was, you know, due to several things. So, uh, like a lot of other people, I actually had a postdoc list as well. 
from second I used to bookmark, this is a lab that's really good, I maybe would write to them, uh, and so on. And then through networking, you know, every time I went overseas, I tried to network, I go to those labs that I had in my bookmark, and then visit them, you know, spend a couple of days. Uh, so I got some offers, one of them being from Ulf Reich, who's my, and I always looked up to him, I still do, uh, he's in Cambridge, very early works uh, he did, so there was offer from him. There was some offer from New Zealand, uh, other scientists as well, but it was not in DNA methylation. It was aligned work in epigenetics. My visa was expiring in five, six months, so I probably had to be out of the country. Uh, and uh, um, at the time, it was only 12 months post visa you get, post work. Now it's 36 months, so it was not, it was a bit difficult then. And also, I think some of you probably understand that, uh, you know, if you uh, come from a different background, uh, that, that there's a lot of expectation from you sometime, and it's probably not very easy to deal with. So I come from India. Uh, my family was always very supportive. They were amazing. But in general, there's a lot of expectation. Um, and so altogether, it was quite a complicated situation uh, to take a decision. So I decided to stay. And these are the factors when I was thinking about it. What are the factors? So one of the things was that I'm pretty hopeless because DNA methylation is the only thing that interests me. In, and even today, nothing else interests me in science. So you know, it's good. And maybe it's bad. I don't know. But I, I, I took two months break after PhD. I went home uh, and didn't do anything. So I decided if I do science, I'll only do DNA methylation because I can't be interested in anything else. So I politely rejected all the other offers um, that was there, that was not in DNA methylation. Um, and then I was thinking what I'm going to do. So then I actually had a cutting edge technique that we developed with Peter Stockwell, Ewan Roger, and Ian Morrison during my PhD. Uh, so I could stay, apply the different things, and publish if things works out, or I could leave and start a new life somewhere else, maybe with Wolf Fry. So it was a hard decision, and then I decided to uh, wait, and then because it took a long time to sort of develop that, and I wanted to sort of apply to different things. Uh, I was very fortunate to sort of have Ian Morrison and then Mike Eccles, uh, who came along and then spoke to me and said he wanted to use my technique in cancer, and I was pretty excited because I didn't work on cancer in my PhD. It was very fundamental work. Uh, and I was pretty keen to apply that there. I was pretty interested in that. Personal situation, I think we are not a person in isolation, right? So uh, my partner, uh, she was doing PhD. She was pretty early on PhD. So me leaving, going overseas will mean, you know, two to three years, you know. So I was not ready personally to actually do that either. Uh, and there was support around me. I studied PhD here. I had a great department in pathology. I was very supportive. So I, I knew that I'll get that support and dream team. Funding was uncertain, and I think it will always be. Uh, we have to probably deal with it and be ready to fight for it, basically. So it was uncertain as well. But altogether, I decided to stay. And for a long time, I wondered whether it's the right decision or wrong. And I'll tell you in, in a second. Oh, OK. So first year, uh, there was no money. Uh, but Ian wrote some grants. I wrote some grants, $15,000, you know, small grant and things. We pulled it together, and it became half FT for one year uh, from Ian. And then Mike wrote some grants, and then you know he pulled some money together, so it became half FT from Mike. So that was my first year of postdoc funding, you know. So I was shared between Ian and Mike. But it was great. I was working on DNA methylation in both labs because I made it clear I'm not going to work on anything else. I, otherwise, I quit. So that was that. And then, <clears throat> so I was doing the research that I want. And during that time, I took some initiative to go to uh, you know, different places, uh, fellowship, because I kind of felt that I'm not going overseas. I mean, I'm from overseas originally, but you know, still. Uh, so I got this JSP in Japan, you know, this fellowship from Royal Society, went to Japan, tried to learn new techniques, bring it back so that I could always upskill myself being here and, and be relevant to the world. And then after one year of half-half, uh, I got this New Zealand Institute of Cancer Research Trust Fellowship, which is, I think is an amazing opportunity. I was, I was really fortunate to get that. So this, uh, Mike Eagles is the chair of that. So this fellowship actually says that I have to make a contribution in cancer research, and I'm not tied to any project. Uh, I have to work with Mike Eagles on the mission of you know, contributing to cancer. And I think this was really uh, you know, very important sort of point because generally we'll be associated with a project, and which is fine, but having that broad sort of scope that just go and then contribute in cancer research, I think was really fortunate. So this is a productive time, and then 2015, I went to this Keystone meeting, and I knew Peter Jones. Peter Jones is the father of epigenetics, cancer epigenetics. So he appeared in Time magazine. I always read his paper from PhD day one. So uh, I met him quite a few times. Uh, he's actually a relative in Christchurch, so he comes to New Zealand sometime for holidays. 
Uh, anyway, so Peter Jones encouraged me to apply uh, for a fellow position in Van Andel Institute, and he was taking up this position as a director there. So that was a dream sort of position because fellow positions, so I'll be like a junior PI uh, under Peter Jones, you know, so that was great. But that didn't work out. Uh, then I thought that I, you know, I wanted to be independent. I wanted to become a PI. I wanted to sort of always kind of wanting to do that. So I applied for this some assistant professor position elsewhere, uh, and I got rejected in all of them. Uh, then Peter Jones, actually, because the fellowship position didn't work out, offered me a senior postdoc position. So that was a great opportunity as such, right? But I didn't go because uh, I thought I'm not ready for a senior postdoc because I, I was doing pretty okay here. I was pretty happy here. The next step I wanted to take was to become an independent lab head or independent but within mentorship, that's fine. So it was a very difficult decision to take that whether I kind of not go with Peter Jones who's like, you know, and he's a, he's a wonderful person. I know him personally, so, you know, but I decided not to go. So this is the risk, actually, that I took. But then there was other people who really encouraged me and stay that, you know, keep doing what you're doing. If you really like it, you know, it will work out. So then the next sort of couple of years, and I, like I said, I, I always doubted, even after reject, you know, not going to Peter Jones, I sort of continued to sort of doubt that maybe it's the wrong decision, it will not work out, you know, you know, I probably never become a PI. You know, you, you can't help this, this thinking. But the coming two years was really productive. There was a lot of grants. I got with Mike, writing Mike. I wrote my small grants. Uh, it was a very productive time. We, in this period, probably got 17 papers or something, which was really fortunate, but again, that came for the team. And I continued to go, go for these fellowships to overseas to sort of uh, you know, upscale yourself. So this is a, one where I went to China. It was a challenging trip, but I wanted to learn single cell DNA methylation. So I went there. They were the first lab to do it. So I continued to sort of do that so that I don't become irrelevant in the world uh, being here. So I think there's a risk, but if you have tenacity and if you could if you could chase it, I, I believe it will happen today or tomorrow. And that's the kind of thing I learned from here. So anyway, this is just a slide, not to show, show off, to be honest. This was kind of just showing the journey that this is where I was when I went for other for Discovery Fellowship. Uh, this is one of the interview slides. And so what I wanted to say here is that, you know, you probably don't know when the end goal is going to come, but you have a goal and you're working towards it. And one by one, you sort of build up, you know, and eventually it, it looks pretty good, actually, if you constantly work for it through different pathways. So this is where I was and, and fortunately got the Rutherford Discovery Fellowship and that allowed me to start my own lab. Um, okay, so I think this, this slide probably looks like an American uh, TV show, you've got to be happy and, and things like that. But, but you know, science, I, I, Vernon just mentioned, science actually it could be quite lonely. Uh, it, it is quite isolating. A scientist works because, because that's how it's set up. So I think it's important that you be involved in the community, uh, you know, with, with friends, family, do other things. So create a sort of happy bubble for yourself. And, and that's exactly what happened to me. Uh, and in that way, you feel that you are embedded here, you know, in this place, you belong here. Uh, and, and that's really important for keep you going to, because otherwise the journey is pretty hard. We know that. So create that. And if that happens, then you'll feel much better about the science you do as well. It will enhance your good feeling about science. So I was pretty fortunate to be involved um, in, in this society, and I really feel that I belong here. So just a couple of things to sort of finish off. Uh, I think like every other career, this needs planning, and this needs probably more planning, uh, because the kind of environment we are living in right now uh, is changing all the time. In, in funding, opportunities are changing, new opportunities coming in. For example, the HRC uh, impact guideline just changed. So if you are to write one, you have to think differently now. Uh, it is di very different than how it used to be six months ago. So come back to it every three to six months uh, and revise and think, do you have to re-strategize? Uh, what do you need to do, go to the next stage, and what are the things that you need to do, and then plan and come back and then revise? Uh, niche, I think niche is very important. Uh, we, we all talk about that, I guess, uh, in different one way or the other. And if you want to be a PI or not a PI, other pathway, I think a niche in academia is quite important. Because you always think, okay, if I want to be a lab head, so what my lab is going to work on that is so different. But even then, if you're a stable scientist, then what is that one thing that you do that probably no one else can do, or only two people or three people can do, not, you know, but so I think you need to sort of think about that. Because it's good to have some broad skills, but niche is really important. That's why people are going to come to you. And it's always not very easy to sort of find things that niche because you'll think, I know how to do qPCR, I don't know how to do Western blot, but that's not really special, you know. Uh, but you can think because these are actually prerequisites. Based on that, you can actually build a niche. And you might get training for this. You might actually go somewhere to learn that, but identify what that is for you. 
building a team, if I have to choose one factor, allowed to choose only one factor, then I think the team that I worked with was really the most important factor in whatever happened uh, in my life so far. Uh, I was working, uh, like I said, Ian's and Ian's team, and then later on, you know, like Peter, Ewan, Matt, you know, like there's a lot of other people. And, and we just continue to work, actually, for now eight, ten years, and it, it continued. So I think uh, with that, you can do four to six papers per year uh, because you contribute your niche to a couple of other projects. You get a couple of papers. You have one or two of your own independent projects. So it looks like you're very productive, right? You can drive research. You can collaborate. Uh, so I think that's really important, and, and that takes time. So think about you know, the kind of science it's going to look like for you and what are the team you need and, and then build up that relationship and then team as you go forward. Collaboration, of course, is a very key because you know, these days, the way we work, we've gone out those days when you'll be working isolated in a bench and producing nature papers. I, I don't think that happens anymore. Uh, so I think collaborating is really key. But in early stages, I think collaborating could be quite dangerous. Uh, that's from my experience because things might not lead to anything. So everyone is coming to you, hey, you want to do that with me, you know, stuff, great. But be a bit strategic about it. Uh, so this team is productive. Uh, what, what are you going to get out of it? You have to be ruthless, to be honest, uh, in, in, in the beginning. Collegial, but still you've got to know what you want to do. So always publication is a really, you know, important thing, and you need to get out of that, uh, out of collaboration. But it could be a reference letter. It could be, um, you know, overseas collaborator. You go there, you give a talk there. They'll be very happy to let you give a talk. You know, it builds your CV, I invited talk. So think about all the other ways that you can get benefit out of that, but you need to collaborate uh, in today's world uh, to be in science. Uh, taking every opportunity, I think I have probably covered uh, most of the stuff, uh, but um, you know, you come back to this timeline and, and take every opportunity that is coming towards you, but uh, it got to suit you. So every opportunity means for you. You know, so not everything, you might waste your time. So think about the timeline, what do you want to be in three to four years, and it works towards the goal in patience. Uh, and I have noticed, particularly here uh, in, in New Zealand, um, in, in Otago, that it's really very collegial atmosphere, and, and people are really, really helpful. So if they see that, you know, you're very passionate about something, whatever that might be, and you go there, you approach them, very senior investigators, because there's no hierarchy exists here, unlike a lot of other places that I've seen. Uh, and you really want to sort of help and advise, they genuinely do that here. So I think it's really fortunate environment. So make the world work for you. Um, they will. Eventually it benefits everyone, and it probably benefits them too. So, yeah. So finally, uh, just want to say why I do science, and you know, it's, it's only for me, uh, or, or it's my personal one. It, you know, people might not associate with it, not for everyone, but uh, it's, it's a hard road, right? Like, you all know, I don't need to tell you anymore. Uh, there's more failures. We say in the lab, 90% experiment fails and 10% works, but we work for the 10%. Uh, in, insane competition for any position, right? Anything, postdoc, PI, of course, in any position comes up, there's insane competition. So it's not easy, actually, to remain motivated this entire time because it's a long journey. Um, you know, you, you don't get results like every day, like, you know, amazing results. You have to work for it. So it's very difficult to sort of um, maintain that motivation. But what keeps me going is that, like I said, from, you know, in childhood, uh, I enjoyed the aspect that you ask new questions, the scientists ask new questions, discover something new, they're the first one to, you know, find that out, whatever small or big that might be. So <clears throat> I, I ask questions that I want to ask. So I, I'm interested in understanding cancer metastasis, for example, from the DNA methylation point of view. No one, no one told me that uh, that's the question I have to ask. Uh, that's I thought and I was interested in asking. So I still ask that question with my team. Um, I learn new things every day. If I read a paper, I'm the only person who's reading it, you know, learning from it the entire day. And at the end of all this, I get paid. I mean, we all get paid. And I don't know any other job in the world that will do that, that you will earn your own question, you ask your own question, you learn new things, go home, you get paid. So, you know, and, and that aspect of asking new questions every day. So um, that's why I think I love science. This is the best job for me. And uh, I hope it continues. And I hope that I... I am able to think, uh, you know, coming days as well, you know, 20 years later or whatever. So that's it. And uh, I didn't show any result on any science, of course. This is not the talk. But of course, anything that I have said or done, there's a lot of people uh, that were involved always. And I always feel as if I'm a spokesperson. Um, so thank you to everybody who was involved uh, in any of the work I've done and the funders. And uh, thank you to you. So thank you. 
Morena, good morning, everyone. Apologies, my voice is a little... Uh, took a turn for the worse, unfortunately, after a couple of weeks of having a cold. I hope you can still hear me well, and I asked for a mobile microphone because I like to walk and talk and use my hands a lot. Um, so first of all, congratulations to everyone who's a postdoc. Um, it is actually almost Postdoc Appreciation Week. So not something that's necessarily celebrated a lot in New Zealand, however, we did celebrate that a lot in the United States and our university always provided free ice cream that week. So just throwing that out there, so maybe Otago wants to take that up as well. I know it's not much, it's just free ice cream, but hey, it's free ice cream. Um, so, and as a postdoc, you get to appreciate the small things in life, as you probably know. Um, now I'm just saying, oh, this went too far, there we go. Um, it's almost postdoc appreciation week. It actually was last week, so we are now in the next week back to being underappreciated, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but still, hey, good on you. We're glad to have you. You're really running this whole show, aren't you? So I'm going to give you a slightly different talk from Anruda, I think. Um, I will briefly talk about my own experience, how I got my postdoc and how my career turned out, um, but I will draw mostly on experience that I got during my postdoc in recruiting colleagues, other postdocs, and also recruiting for my own lab. Things that I would recommend to look into, things I want you to think about before you apply during the application process, and also a few questions that you want to think about when you're actually going for the interview. So I'll first talk about reasons to postdoc or not to, and I am realizing that some of the things I say might be polarizing, and I, I'm happy to discuss them, but I'll just give you my take, and that of course might be very different from other people's. Um, then I talk a bit about myself. Uh, finally, how do you find this position, and also how should your CV look, and how should your interview go, best case scenario. Um, so first of all, postdocs, great. Um, you really want to think carefully if you want to do one or not, is my opinion. I do not think you should do a postdoc just because. Why is that? Because a postdoc to me really is a stepping stone into an independent academic career, meaning you want to run your own lab. You want to be a PI. Now, um, this graph just shows that there's many, 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 many different ways going from your PhD to being a PI or not. Because actually, a faculty job is an alternative career. So if you look at all of the PhD graduates, there will only be about 10% that will eventually have tenure track or full-time permanent positions as PIs, 10%. Meaning 90% will not run their own labs. And I think that's really important for you to realize that the chances are not that good that you're gonna end up there. And I'm not saying that to discourage you. I think if that's what you wanna do, go for it and go for it all the way. I mean, I did it, it worked, right? So clearly, if I can do it, you can do it. But it does take a lot of hard work, a lot of determination, time, and luck. And I'm not gonna lie, right? So there's many, many factors that play into that. And it's really not meant for everyone. So just be aware of these things before you set out to your postdoc. Now, one thing that I also want to highlight is the postdocalypse. So what's happening is, as you can see in blue, um, those are annual PhDs awarded, and then in orange are faculty positions. So you can see that over time, there's more and more and more PhDs on the job markets, but there's not more and more and more PI positions. So clearly, alternative careers, and I know that you hear a lot about alternative careers in the afternoon today, and it's great that you're here and you're actually informing yourself into what your options are, because there's many and they're all great. You just have to decide for yourself what you want. Um, now, since we're all scientists, we should define what a postdoc actually is, and there's a few things I need to highlight before we go ahead. It is a temporary period. You can't postdoc forever. This is not a career. It's mentored research. So you have a mentor, and your mentor is going to be really important, and now I broke it. <laughs> and training, scholarly training for the purpose of acquiring the professional skills needed to pursue a career path of his or her choosing. His or her choosing, very good, right? So whatever you want to do after. So reasons to postdoc, to me, there's two. One, you want to be a PI, and you want to your run your own lab, you have to do a postdoc. End of story. Two you are not wanting to be a postdoc, but you want to go, say, to biotech, to industry, you want to run your own startup, 
you want to do something else and you know what that is, but you also realize that you need to acquire essential skills before you can go down that road. One example would be you want to work in industry on developing new cancer therapeutics, but you did your PhD in, I'm trying to think of something really different and I'm trying not to offend anyone, so please don't be offended if you work in, say, worms or fruit flies and maybe you studied some genetics and it's really, really cool and that's what you always wanted to do, but it's not the right skill set to work on pharmaceutical development in cancer, right? So if you realize that and you know you have to do a postdoc to get, for example, cell culture experience, mouse experience, mass spec, immunology, whatever it is, do that, but then just choose accordingly, right? Be aware of the skills that you need for the next step and acquire them actively in your postdoc. There's a lot more reasons not to postdoc, and one of them is you don't know what else to do. And I feel that happens to a lot of people, you know, they come out of school and they're like, eh, I kind of like biology, so I'm doing a biology degree. Eh, I don't really know what to do with the biology degree, so I'm just going to stay here in my honor set to do a PhD. Eh, yeah, well, now I'm a PhD, so I guess I'm going to do a postdoc. So that's not really going to get you anywhere, right? You have to know where you're getting at the end of the day. And that's the only way of really achieving your goals is if you actually have goals, right? And, and just saying, oh yeah, well, I don't know what else to do. That's, that's probably a bad idea because you end up in your 30s, maybe in your 40s on temporary contracts that are getting shorter and shorter and getting harder and harder to get and you don't want to be there, trust me. Other reasons not to postdoc because other people tell you to, don't do what other people tell you to, do what you want to do, always. Um, it's not a must-have on your CV at all. There's many careers where you don't need a postdoc and it can be a waste of time. And finally, sometimes it happens that your supervisor, your mentor tries to convince you, oh, wouldn't it be great if you just finish up that one last experiment for this one paper? Yeah, and we also know how that goes. This one experiment turns into 10, one year turns into many more, and the depression sets in, so don't do that. Don't do that, seriously. If you, there is sometimes there is a case to be made that you stay for another year in your PhD lab to finish things up. Rarely, I think, because you can finish things up from the distance, that's what I did. But sometimes maybe a year is a good idea, never longer than a year, in my opinion. <clears throat> okay, so what if you don't know what you wanna do? <laughs> See, I hear that happens too. Um, think about questions like, what do you enjoy about, being, about doing in your PhD? What do you not enjoy about the PhD? And that can give you an idea of where you want to head from here. And also think about what am I good at? And I'm not talking about PCR, I'm talking about things like communication. Maybe you're really good at presenting, maybe you're really good at writing, editing, things like that. Right? So additional skills that you could possibly get a career at. Um, and to, to do those, to find out what you're good at, you could do things like self-assessment and if anyone's interested in uh, details here, I can give you some hints and some tips and some websites. Um, talk to your mentor. I know it's daunting and maybe you don't actually want their opinion, but they know you best and they can give you an honest opinion of where they see you in the future. And also think about having an individual career development plan. Good thing, by the way, for all stages of your career. Okay, so brief introduction about me. <clears throat> As you can tell, maybe from my voice and my accent, I'm German originally. Um, and this is my hometown on the left here. Beautiful, 1,000 year old bridge, 1,000 year old cathedral, very proud. Um, also, that's the place I studied, so I didn't get very far <laughs> for my undergrad. Um, but after that, I decided that I have to explore the world, so I did um, a master's degree in Finland for two years, which is on the right, and as you can see, it's cold. Um, so the, the way I got there is also, it's, many things in science just happen, right? So basically because I lived in Germany, and if you live in Germany, you always go on vacation to Italy and Spain and Greece, and I've been there a million times before, so I figured, ah, I've never been to the north, so I, maybe I should study there. So I drove two and a half days up north, and I ended up in Finland with not a single word of Finnish, and then I stayed there for two years, and it was great. Fantastic. Very, very cold, but fantastic. Um, but because it was so cold, I decided I have to go back to Germany after for my PhD. So I came back to my hometown and did my PhD there. Um, and then I did my postdoc in the United States. And I'll tell you how that happened. So in the last year of my PhD, 
I decided it's time for a big international conference. And one of those big international conferences that I always had dreamed of going to are at Cold Spring Harbor, uh, which is on Long Island in uh, New York State. And I just applied, you know, just registered for the conference, sent my abstract in, didn't even show it to my mentor because he was too busy. And then I got a talk there. So that was pretty amazing. So the meeting I went to was this meeting here. Um, and so I did my PhD in epigenetics, I should say that, epigenetics and chromatin. Very basic research, not very applied at all. And then I went to this conference, for some reason got a talk. Um, and of course that was the highlight of my PhD, right? I'm at this fantastic conference in New York. I'm also giving a talk. I was totally out of my mind and I was also very, very nervous. So that after my talk, the first thing I did went to the wine bar and had several glasses of wine before I went to the poster session. Big mistake because at the poster session, this gentleman approached me and probably at my third or fourth glass of wine. Uh, this is David Spector who ended up being my postdoc supervisor. And um, he just, he's also the organizer of this conference and he just basically walked over and said, hey, great talk, what are you gonna do next? And I'm like, yeah, I don't know, I guess I'm doing a postdoc in the United States. Huh. Do you have a job for me? And he's like, yep, I do. And that was it. <laughs> so um, obviously I went through the whole interview stage after that, but, but that was basically how it happened for me. And I think that's how it can happen for many people. So basically going to conferences, going to meetings, not being shy, maybe have a glass of wine if you're usually a shy person, uh, that helps. So being on a job, job so, so market is not the time to be shy and uh, maybe also not the time to be drunk in front of your future mentor. But anyways, it worked out for me and we had a fantastic time, David and I, and I actually switched fields a little a bit. So, um, as I said, PhD, epigenetics, chromatin, postdoc, cancer biology. So I learned a lot about human organoids, mouse models, drug treatments. We collaborated with industry. So there was a lot of things that I learned out of my postdoc. And it was successful too, as you can see, because now I'm here and I'm a lecturer and running my own lab and it's all very exciting. <clears throat> so how do you find this postdoc position? As I mentioned, for me, conference worked. And I think that's a really good way of going about it because you can, you're seeing the person um, face to face. So that's a really good idea. If you present a poster or even if you're presenting a talk, it's a great introduction because people will know your face, right? Other very good option, collaborations. Um, ask your mentor or maybe during your um, PhD you already have a collaboration internationally, not internationally, but with another lab and you know the people, you know the PI, you know you're getting along well, that's a really good starting point. You can always ask your mentor or other PIs, do you know someone in the field of, this is where I wanna go. So for example, now that you all know me, if you wanna go, for example, to Cold Spring Harbor, feel free to send me an email and say, hey, I wanna work in Limo Joshua Tours lab on structure of something in microRNAs then email me and I'll email Limo and I say, hey Limo, you know what? I have this great student from New Zealand, are you interested? There's a very high chance that you, maybe you don't get the job but at least your application will be looked at versus otherwise, maybe not so much, right? So use your network, I'm part of your network. Pretty much every PR in your department is part of your network. Make use of it by all means. There are um, options like job boards, nature jobs, science careers and so on. Um, databases, bot, I mean all of these are going to be less personal, so of course your chances are going to be not as good as if you have a direct connection to a person. Um, social media presence is key and I'm talking about both the lab you want to go to and your own because what happened to me during my interview in David's lab is that his assistant had actually googled me and printed all the social media profiles she could find. Um, I did clean it up beforehand, luckily, so she only found my research gate profile, which was fine. But if you have any drunk pictures on Facebook, time to remove them. Um, do get a Twitter account. I highly recommend it. I'm not as good on Twitter as I should be, but I am retweeting like crazy all job offers that I can find. And I know many of my colleagues do that too, so that's a good way of um, connecting with people as well. Um, can you write cold emails? Can you just email and say, hey, I'm really interested in your lab and I want to do a postdoc with you? Yes, you can, but do it right. I get about 10 of those emails per week and I do not reply to 99%. Why not? Because they're always, they start with, dear sir or madam. All right, so you don't even know whom you're addressing here. So I know you're already sending out this email to pretty much every PI in Otago, many of them wrong field, like bioengineering and things that I really have nothing to do with. So. Don't do that, 
massively, but if you have someone, you know someone in the field, your science hero, someone that you think uh, you really, really, really want to work for, do send them an email, just don't start it with dear sir or madam. Address them properly, tell them why you're emailing them. I love this paper about you. I saw you at this conference. This was brilliant. I'm really interested in a postdoc. And maybe they don't have an open position, but maybe they're happy to collaborate with you. Maybe they're happy to support you for a postdoctoral fellowship application. There's many ways from there. Um, so you can do that, just, just do it right. And if you're, for example, going to a conference, look at the program ahead of time and see Ah, oh, these three people, maybe I want to do a postdoc with them, email them before the conference and say, do you want to meet for a coffee or, or a glass of wine at the bar? That's probably your most successful way of going about it. And always tailor your application, as I said, no, dear sir, or madam, or anything like that. <clears throat> so choose wisely. Now that um, you have all these options, how do you actually make your choice? And I'm just going to give you a few bullet points and to, to tell you broadly of things that I know about and things that I would advise on and I'm happy to discuss them in detail later. Um, but the very first thing that you should do probably in the last year or so of your PhD, early if you can, but last year of PhD is a good starting point, is set out your personal goals and expectations for the future. Short term, long term. Postdoc, PI, industry, biotech startup, patent attorney, whatever it is. Choose your postdoc based on experimental skills that are relevant to your next position. So as I mentioned before, you want to go into pharmaceutical industry, then learn techniques that are relevant for that job. Don't stay in the fly business. Scientific writing, big, big, big part if you want to be a PI. That is grants, that is papers, and you know that. So choose something where you will have the opportunity to write your own grants and papers. Choose something where you will have management and supervision skills, meaning supervising grad students, supervising undergrad, supervising research technicians. Any sort of supervision and management will be helpful no matter what you do afterwards. As somebody with a PhD, you are supposed to go into a leadership role, right? So prepare for that leadership role. Check if the lab you're going into has connections with, rele with relevant industry partners. My postdoc did, and that basically got me a job offer in industry during my postdoc as well with our collaborators. So that's something you want to look into, and many labs have that. Look if there's an opportunity to generate IP. Can you get a patent out of this? You can sometimes. So just think about it, depending on the area of research you're in. It could be agriculture, it could be cancer research, but there is opportunities. And these are things that you want to ask and prepare yourself for when you go for a postdoc um, opportunity. And finally, are there any opportunities for things like outreach or science communication, if that's something you're interested in going down the line? Now, how do you choose your PI? What should you think about? In my opinion, if you can, go international. If you are a New Zealand person and you've lived in New Zealand for your whole life, now is the time to leave. I really do think so. I know it's not always possible and you might have personal or family reasons why you can't, but if you can, leave. <clears throat> Go somewhere really good. Do not undersell yourself. You're coming from a great place. You are, you've done your entire PhD in English. You have papers, you have grants, you have awards. You should not undersell yourself. If you want to go to Harvard, go to Harvard, right? Absolutely do. Apply for the right places. You have a very good chance to get a postdoc there. And, if, and as I said before, if you have science heroes like Enruda highlighted, he just emailed whomever he thought was the greatest person. And I think that's exactly what you should do. Email the person that you've read the papers from, email the person that you always wanted to work for. Um, very important is choose a PI that will actively mentor you. So somebody that is invested in your career further down the line and is not only using you as a workhorse. Think about, do you want to work for somebody like me? <laughs> or do you want to work for someone who is very established in the field and very senior? Pros and cons for both. Think about lab size. Many of the international labs, especially in the United States, have 50 postdocs. Do you want to be one of 50? Do you want to be one of five? And th join something that's collaborative, a lab that's collaborative versus competitive. Again, in New Zealand, it doesn't maybe make much sense, but trust me, internationally, everything is so much more competitive within the same lab. And yes, there will be competition with your other postdoc colleagues. Uh, and think about productiveness, not in terms of, oh, this person publishes one nature paper per year, but how many nature papers per year normalize the number of postdocs in the lab. 
And it's also a good idea to choose an institution that has an active, supportive postdoc um, culture, so something with workshops for grant writing, for example. <clears throat> I'm running over time. Am I running over time? No. You stop me when I'm running over time. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm getting to the end anyways. I'm just going to give you some hints towards CV and interview. Um, first of all, an academic CV is a very different beast from your regular CV, and I'll show you mine in a second to give you an idea. If you're first author publications, when you're applying for your postdoc, that's a bonus. If you have something that's, for example, submitted but not accepted yet, put it on the bio archive. That's entirely legit to quote things from the bio archive. I did not have a first author publication when I applied for my postdoc. I still got the job. So as long as you can show you got data, you don't need it to be published, and everyone understands that it takes a year or two after you do things. Set my timer. Okay. <clears throat> If you have any awards, posters, presentations, put them in. Um, if you have any small grants, like a travel grant, put them in. Um, any workshops and conferences you attended, go into your CV. Any teaching, like a lab demonstrator, supervising undergrads, goes into your CV. And finally, this is really important, choose your references wisely. So not only should they know you really well, they should also be prepared to say only positive things and happy to talk on the phone. I always call the references. I don't want things in written because people tell you different things on the phone that they tell you in writing. Um, now, just very briefly, this is how my CV looked like when I applied for faculty positions, so it's going to be slightly different for you. But you can see it looks very, very full on the first, and this is how it's supposed to look, apparently. So this got me a lot of interviews and jobs. So apparently this is how you should do it. Um, and um, maybe what we do in the interest of time is if anyone's interested into more details, just email me and I'm happy to share it with you. Cool. So I'm just going to use the last minute or two to give you some hints about the interview. Um, if you can interview in person, you can also tuck that onto a conference like what I did. Um, Skype is possible, but it's just not going to be as useful for you and for them to identify are you a good fit for the lab. Uh, it still can work though. Um, usually what happens is you give a presentation of your PhD work, and it's very important that you show not only that you did a lot, but also that you know why you did things. So the understanding part, really important. And highlight relevant methods. So show, this is what I can bring to your lab. So for example, I had a lot of experience with high throughput sequencing. This is some expertise that I could bring from my PhD into the postdoc lab. So you can be useful, right? Highlight that. Not the time to be humble. Ask questions that are aligned with your own goals and expectations, as in my previous slide outlined, and then interact as much as possible as you can with the other lab members. Usually people are honest, and they will tell you honestly whether it's a good lab to be in or not. It's also really important that you click with them and your potential mentor, because these are the people you're going to work with for the next few years. Finally, just a reminder, be the best version of yourself. It shouldn't need pointing out, but don't be a weirdo. The amount of weirdos I have encountered. I'll give you one short example. One time, we had this great candidate, perfect talk, really smart guy. We went out for lunch. He ordered a ham sandwich. We sat down, and then he opened his bag, took out another ham sandwich, and proceeded to eat his own ham sandwich. Weird, right? <laughs> Why? I mean, just say I brought my own lunch. Don't order a second ham sandwich. Anyways, so there's just these little things that can throw you off and they can ruin your interview without you knowing it. And dress for the occasion. Shorts and t-shirt, good for a daytime outfit, not good for your interview. Um, a few additional questions that you might want to ask about are things like project finances. How's my fellowship financed? How's the project financed travel? Is there money for workshops for me to go to? Um, how will you be supervised? Do we meet once a year or once a week? Um, is there a mentoring program? What are my collaboration partners? Are there any? Um, and will I be supervising other people like research assistants, PhDs, and so on? How much independence will I have in choosing my own project? How much creativity can I bring to this project? What core facilities are available? And your expectations, uh, this is just practical advice, but expectations regarding health insurance and retirement, especially in the United States. Um, and also work hours and vacation. Ask your lab colleagues, not your mentor about that. Again, in the United States, you might not like the answer. So in summary, um, set out long and short-term goals during the last year of your PhD. Decide very carefully what type of PI and what type of lab you want to go into because it's going to make you miserable if it's the wrong one. Use your existing network. Use conferences. 
ask many, many questions. It shows that you're invested, that you're interested, and also gives you a lot of information. Don't forget to thank you email after. And once you started your postdoc, um, just a reminder to set yourself a timeline. As Andruda said, for example, I said, after two years, I want to have enough data for publication. Had I not gotten that, I would have left and gone to industry. So these are, this is my, my advice. I'm happy to answer any questions. I might not hang around for lunch, but you can always email me if you want my CV or if you want to talk to me about anything, really. Thanks so much, guys. OK, any questions for either of our speakers? Would you like to elaborate on the thank you email? Um, is there any specific thing you would like to address in, in that type of email? So I would, I would recommend that at the very minimum you send a thank you email to the mentor. Many people also send thank you emails to the other lab members that they met and just to say, guys, thank you, that was great, it was nice to meet you, I hope to see you soon. To your mentor, I would be more, a bit more specific and just say that you really enjoyed, well, assuming that you would want the job still after the interview, of course, um, that you really enjoyed um, visiting the lab and you absolutely can see yourself in the future and maybe um, if you discussed a project Maybe a short abstract, short summary about how you would approach the project, what, you, what could you bring to the team again. So um, I can give my own experience here, for example. Um, David suggested that we look into um, non-coding RNAs in cancer, so I said, yeah, so I, based on my experience, um, I would do this, this, and the other thing, and I think it would take me approximately six months, and then from there we could go and see and do X, Y, Z. So just be very specific, show that you thought about it, and you're really interested, really invested. That's what I would recommend. Hi, um, this is for either of you. So you, your advice is quite specific for applying for your first postdoc. What advice would you give, or like what would you do slightly differently if you're applying for a second postdoc? I'll answer first and say that I'm not a believer in second postdocs. <coughs> Sorry. I also <laughs> would say that I don't really believe in second postdocs. But uh, I, I know, you know some uh, sort of colleagues and, and stuff, they've done it. Uh, there could be many situations. One that it was very quick postdoc. First postdoc was quite toxic. So you left and then went to the second postdoc. And I know a couple of people in Otago, I'm not going to name them. It really worked out brilliantly for them, uh, going to the second postdoc. And that really took them off and they became a PI. Uh, another thing is that uh, you know, if you want to expand uh, sort of expertise, but uh, aligned area. So say, for example, you, know, you work on sequencing and stuff. You want to sort of do a CRISPR now, for example. And then together, you, know, you can still you know, apply in the same thing, say, for example, cancer. So you did a second postdoc, but as such, you know, I mean, I don't think it's really a first option going for a second postdoc, if you can avoid it. I'm sorry if I sounded rough. <laughs> Um, I, I completely see where you're coming from and, and I think if you are doing a second postdoc then you really, really, really have to be 1000% sure that you want to be a PI because there's really no reason to do two postdocs if you don't want to be a PI. So then just highlight that and say for XYZ reasons I've done postdoc A and I learned a thing and now I need to learn another thing to become that PI that I want to be because in my future lab I want to CRISPR uh, honeybee, and I only learned CRISPR, but I don't know anything about the honeybee yet, so that's Peter Dearden, why I want to work with you, for example. <laughs> um, okay, maybe I should be more specific, so not necessarily a second postdoc, but like a research fellowship that maybe at a different university, or would that be just more applying for grant, your own grants? And so I guess this is kind of similar to if, what if you are almost applying to a faculty position, would it be, right? Yeah. So you're just, you're trying to get independence at this stage. Am I getting that right? You're wanting, you're wanting to go to the next step. Yep. Um, there, I think we could do a whole day on discussing how to get your first independent position because it's a whole nother beast. And there's a lot of different rules that apply compared to a postdoc because you're going into an unmentored position. So postdoc is mentored training. Fellowship is unmented, your own position, you are driving it, you are responsible. So I'm not sure that I can give you a short answer to that, but I'm most happy to discuss any specific questions that you might have later. Uh, I think just going to add very quickly, I think uh, this is pretty different uh, to a second postdoc. Uh, so, you know, and it's a New Zealand context as well, right, you know. 
So I think you want to get a sort of next year tenured position, uh, that kind of stuff, or a fellowship to continue research independently. So I guess you've got to think that what are the things that you'll be getting in your second research fellow whenever you're going. So it could be the independence and niche that you can work on, uh, which you already probably have, but you can now build your own and then go for a fellowship to be completely independent. So wh what is actually your goals? And then in this new position that you'll be applying, how that's going to fulfill. So I guess if you think about that, then, then that's how you can probably plan it. Thanks. Um, I think, yeah, Sarah, we both are sort of available. I mean, I'm available later on, but also feel free to email us. I guess you both will be happy to share anything, uh, CV or any, um, any other tips you might have. And yeah, thank you. Nope. <laughs>